You know, after seeing the great intensity and power of the coming of our Lord Jesus in the Eucharistic presence on his altar, as we saw in our last session through the Eucharistic prayer, we'll now discuss the concluding parts of the Mass. But keep in mind, let's pick up where we left off. In the Eucharistic prayer, through the power of the Holy Spirit, we remembered in such a way that we were transported there. There, of course, being the upper room on the first Holy Thursday night, there also being the foot of the cross there at Calvary. And we were there, present, with those who were also there as well, some 2,000 years ago. And Christ himself comes down to be with us. It's a no whole new way of existing, okay? You can exist in someone's mind with a memory. Obviously, I can see you, you're existing physically. You can exist sort of in the spirit, so to speak. I can remember angels and so forth. But Jesus has another way of existence, sacramentally. That's still his substantive presence there on the altar. So after the Eucharistic prayer, we've been kneeling all this time, as we rise from kneeling to stand to say the Lord's Prayer. Now, technically, the Lord's Prayer is the first part of the final preparations, which are sometimes called the communion rite. But right off the bat, we experience something quite wonderful. For those who truly believe what's just taken place, that our Lord Jesus is now present with us upon that altar, we now offer to the Father the prayer our Lord Jesus himself has given to us. We actually get to say it with our Lord Jesus. Now think about that for just a second. Don't think, man, how cool would that have been to kind of hang him back with the apostles, man, kind of like, you know, you know, be part of that group, you know, sneaking around and so forth, and one of them says, you know, Lord, teach us how to pray. He says, when you pray, here's how you pray. Our Father, and you were there to hear that? Well, guess what? You're still there with our Lord Jesus every time you go to Mass to pray the prayer he gave us with him. But also, of course, there's something that's just wonderful, with him to the Father. And so, you can just imagine, this is done with a heightened sense of joy and of thanksgiving. We're doing this with Jesus himself. Now, because most of us say the Our Father pretty much every day, right? And since we say this prayer every time we do have Mass, we don't want to take it for granted. So the priest speaks words of wisdom to us. At the Savior's command, who, by the way, is right there in front of me, okay, so I'm not just saying something kind of, you know, theoretical. No, at the Savior's command, he's right here, guys. So at his command, and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say. And so we then utilize at that moment the great gift of the Holy Spirit, the gift of the fear of the Lord. Or in other words, awe. Awe because we're approaching the Father. Now the thing to keep in mind is a good, big, big slice at that point of heaven itself. Because don't forget... The whole destiny, the whole journey, all of this we keep talking about, everything about our Catholic faith, and especially about the Mass, is to get us to heaven. And heaven, of course, is all about what? The Father. It's all about the Father. And so big, big slice of heaven we're diving into at that moment. Now, as many of you know, the ancient Jews, though they certainly saw God as Father, they did not address Him as such. But we do. Because the Lord Jesus calls us, he invites us, he reminds us. That even though he's the true son, we are still his adopted sons and daughters to the Father. Now the word our is very important because it points to a deep unity that we all have since we all together come from our Heavenly Father. Jesus' Father has become our Father. And what a better place to celebrate this than right there at Mass perfect place to do that. Now to give a whole class just on the Our Father, okay, let's move now to the end of that prayer. And as soon as we all say, and deliver us from evil, then the priest says a prayer to our Lord asking him to give us a new kind of peace. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days. That by the help of your mercy, may always be free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. 
First of all, whenever we hear that, that phrase, the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ, we oftentimes you think about, of course, the second coming. And he comes in glory and majesty. And that is part of the reference to that. There's a much more fundamental and specific reference as we await the coming of our Savior. How long do you have to wait? Oh, maybe three minutes if you're in the front row. It can be five if you're in the back row. You have to wait very long. He's going to be there with you on your tongue in Holy Communion. That is what you're specifically awaiting, that coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, okay? But overall, let's take a little bit deeper look at this. Because the peace that we are asking for from our Lord is not just an absence of war or stress or trial. And for the professor, Edward Shree, he points out, talking about this part of the Mass, he said, the biblical understanding of peace, in other words, shalom, is first and foremost something profoundly personal, spiritual. See, this peace points to an inner wholeness and well-being as a gift from God. You see, for the Orthodox Jews, some of them have even forgotten how powerful this is, but the greeting shalom is not just, hey, how you doing? Hello. Shalom is actually asking you a question. Are you at peace? Do you have wholeness? Do you have integrity? All that in that one word was the same thing we're dealing with here. That peace is what we're going to be able to receive, okay? And so we finally entrust our lives to our Lord. That's, of course, exactly why we come to Mass, right? We can discover a deep inner peace that no one can take from you. No one. A peace you can ground your life in. A peace that is the very presence, of course, of Jesus himself. Not just a sense of contentment. Not just a sense of having things lined up. It's him. He, of course, is your peace. The next petition, though, in that little prayer from the priest is it ask the Lord Jesus to free us from sin and distress. In other words, we pray for protection upon the peace that we will be receiving, especially in its fullness in Holy Communion. We actually do receive Jesus. So we pray for the protection of that peace. Because, as we all know, if we leave Mass, even though we've been through all this incredible blessing, we go back and give in to selfishness, Pride, envy, lust, greed. We will never keep our peace. It will slip right through our fingers. And thus we'll never fully be blessed or happy. We'll always then tend to be insecure, restless, seeking more control, more pride, more attention, and so forth. And let's not kid ourselves, even as Christians go through fears, ups and downs, trials and headaches, we're not exempt from that. But at this moment of the Mass, the priest prays that Jesus deliver us from all anxiety and worry as we await the blessed hope. As we await the blessed hope. Okay, what are we waiting for? What's the blessed hope? It's heaven. Just that simple. It's home. We first of all hope that we worthily receive the means of getting back home to heaven which is our biggest hope, is Jesus Christ. Now some of you have a struggle with that because you have struggles with trust in general. Okay? You have trust issues. It might be with your parents, it might be with your boss, it might be with you know, your, your cat, I don't know about this thing here, okay, all right? <laughs> it might be with God, all right? But what does God give us every time you come to Mass is in this prayer? There it is on a big old platter, you better grab it. Don't get no little crumb. Get the whole thing, will you? Okay? Take the whole thing. What does Jesus give to you? He gives you hope. Hope that comes from Him. Now, I've told you this many, many times before. What is hope again? Hope is Jesus Christ Himself telling you, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. Now, if He's telling you that every time you go to Mass, that it's going to be okay, then guess what? You can trust Him. See how that works? Those two wonderfully go hand in hand. And then just like the angels in heaven, we once again praise God, and this is a great statement of praise. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Beautiful statement. Now some people like to think that those words are the Protestant ending to the Lord's Prayer, because you know our, our Protestant brothers and sisters, you know, they tack it onto the Lord's Prayer all the time. 
And those poor guys, when they come to a funeral or wedding at the Catholic Church, and they come to check it out and so forth, we say the Our Father, and then the priest says this prayer, and they're all ready to go. And the, for the eyes of God, what? What's up, you Catholics, man? You can finish the prayer. Okay. <laughs> oh, now here it comes. Okay, you guys went that crazy after all. Okay, right? But some people might think that's the Protestant ending. But those words have deep biblical roots way before any Protestant said them. Those words represent words of King David in his last act as king before he passed over his power to his son Solomon. So way back in 1 Chronicles chapter 29, what do we read? What's David saying? Blessed art thou, O Lord, the God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Thine, O Lord, is the greatness, and the power, and the glory, and the victory, and the majesty. For all that is in the heavens and in the earth is thine. For thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all. That's where that comes from. We now move to the right of peace. So after we petition God the Father in the Lord's Prayer with our Lord, the priest now talks to Jesus. I talk to our Lord, recalling our Lord's words to the apostles at the Last Supper. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church. And graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Jesus offers to us deeper, longer-lasting peace than the world would certainly offer. Once again, as Edward Shree points out, this is the kind of peace of heart that builds true unity with marriages, families, communities, parishes, nations. And this is what the priest prays for at that moment in the liturgy. Powerful, powerful prayers are going out. Okay? So, in a gesture that's often overlooked the priest says, the peace of the Lord be with you always. Now, there's a couple of aspects here, okay? I don't say, that, may the peace of the Lord be with you to the end of the Mass, and then just go, go kill each other, guys. Go knock yourself out, okay? That, 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 that. <laughs> the peace of the Lord be with you always. Secula, seculorum, right? Peace itself, Jesus himself is right there in our midst. So we're offering peace with and from the Prince of Peace. So this is a very solemn moment, but one that we take far too casually. Now, I'll, don't, go, don't get me wrong, it's great to be with each other at Mass. Real good to see you all there, okay? And sometimes, like at a wedding Mass, or maybe an anniversary Mass, people from all over the place have a little reunion going on there. It's a sign of peace. It's kind of a joyful thing, all right? But the thing that was is this, sometimes we get a little bit carried away. This great solemnity, Jesus is right there on the altar, we just pray to God the Father, we ask for this peace that changes hearts. Let's give each other a sign of peace, you're slapping high five, doing chest bumps, man, you're the elbows bare, baby, what's going on, dog? Okay? That, that's not exactly what we had in mind here, okay? Now one thing though that is kind of, well, sweet, is actually kind of cool. I say this, you know, it's offered to each other a sign of peace. So I turn to go get the rest of our Lord out of the tabernacle, right? And what do I hear? All this smacking. Everybody's kissing each other. It's awesome, all right? It's a beautiful thing. That, that's, that's a cool thing. Don't get me wrong, man. Don't, don't stop doing that, okay? But the overall attitude is that we want those around us. Now, not down across the aisle or up in the front. Are you running up to give high fives to the choir? To the people next to you, you give them the sign of peace. But the overall attitude is you want those around us to be aware that their peace, the peace that changes lives, is right there on the altar. So that is why we say from the Latin, Pax Christi, peace of Christ. We don't say, peace be with you. That's a priestly action. That's a, actually a priestly blessing. God, I love you guys. God, I haven't seen any of you guys with me in seminary. Then, no, I think it was just me. Okay? All right? You're still a priestly people. Don't get me wrong. But the bishop put his hands on me. So it's a blessing that I'm giving you guys. Peace be with you. Jesus be with you. You all have the privilege of reminding each other to those near you. Peace is here. 
the peace of Christ is right over there. We condense that to saying, peace of Christ. We now move to the Lamb of God. Now this part of the Mass contains three rituals. The breaking of the bread, now the body and blood of Christ. The commingling of that body with the blood of Christ. And the recitation of the Lamb of God prayer. So when you see the priest break the host in two, this is known as the fraction, the breaking of the bread, which actually is another term to call Mass itself, the breaking of the bread. Remember, though, from our previous sessions or previous classes, the great action of Jesus in the Mass when it comes to the bread? You all bring up that great gift of yourselves, the bringing up of the bread and wine. He takes it, blesses it, breaks it, and gives it. The great four actions there. Take, bless, break, give. Before the bread is given to you all, it has to be broken. That is not a reference to the great miracle of the multiplication of the fishes and the loaves that he broke the bread to give it out to all the people there, okay? Don't forget, those great miracles foreshadowed the Eucharist, not the other way around. We're not representing the miracle, we're representing Calvary, Easter, Good Friday, all right? And so he, we, we break it because it's an extremely important moment in connection at that point of the Mass. Remember what I told you? Great events in the Mass, great representations, great transportations were taken to these places come in moments, moments. That's literally, literally what we have here. So when you see the priest break the bread, and that's why, especially on Sundays, you have to quickly give each other a sign of peace, or you're going to miss it. Weekday Mass is a little bit easier to see. You see the priest break the bread. That's the crucifixion. That's Jesus dying on the cross. His wonderful body that blessed people, gave sight to the blind, healing to the cripples, raised people from the dead. His beautiful body has been broken for us upon the cross. That's his death when you see that. That's Good Friday. That's the darkness, the earthquake. All that. You just, you're, you're there in that moment. But the thing is, is this. Once that happens, even though Jesus is upon the altar, there's, there's no question about it, we have to remember that his sacrifice being represented is not over with yet. So when I break the host, now the very body of Christ, that is his dying for you upon the cross there at Calvary. But in the very next moment, we're transported from that horrible day of Good Friday to the very, very first Easter Sunday. We're right there in front of the empty tomb. This happens in something called the co-mingling. The co-mingling. The priest breaks off a little small piece of the host that's been divided into two and takes it and puts it into the chalice. That now, of course, now at that point contains the precious blood. And the priest quietly says to himself, may this mingling of the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ bring eternal life to us who receive it. Most of you didn't even know I even say that on your behalf, do you? Okay, so you come up, you receive eternal life when you come up to receive communion. But keep in mind what's going on here. You're there at the empty tomb. But now, why? Because our Lord, He poured out every last ounce of blood for us upon the cross. But in the resurrection, His body and blood are now reunited in His glorified body. And that's exactly what we see. The body is now reunited with the blood. The body is now commingled with the blood. That's Easter. Right there in front of us now, we have the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. So now we have true joy, true peace, because the resurrected Jesus is right there in front of us on that altar. And that's why we now go right into this beautiful prayer of the Lamb of God. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, grant us.
peace. Now, just like the preface earlier in the Mass, just like the Eucharistic prayer, the Lamb of God takes us right up to the throne of the Father in heaven. Right there. And so we're joined with countless numbers of angels, all worshiping there in heaven, who gratefully worship the victorious Lamb, our Lord Jesus Christ, as we see, of course, in the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 5, verses 11 and 12. But John's right for us here. He said, Then I looked and I heard around the throne of the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of angels and thousands and thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. We're part of that. We're caught up into that at that very moment. Now, our Lord Jesus, who of course is the Paschal Lamb, who was sacrificed for our sake, he died so we wouldn't have to. He bled so that he might be covering us with his blood for our salvation. Because his blood washes clean the garments of the saints. His blood conquers the evil one and all that we see in the book of Revelation. And that's why after we say the Lamb of God, we kneel down again in grateful and humble adoration. And when we see him for the next time, what's the priest doing? He's holding up now the broken host sometimes over the patent, but I prefer to do it, it's perfectly fine, over the chalice. So you're seeing body and blood together, all right? What do we see? Straight out of Revelation. You see the lamb, once slain, but who now lives forever. The one who was crucified for you is now alive. And now that all the benefits of Easter are now yours. And so, of course, what are we going to do next? We're going to behold the Lamb of God. So we now come to the most important words that you will hear all week if you come to Mass only on Sunday, or the most important words you'll hear all day if you are a daily communicant. Here, the priest gives a direct quote from St. John the Baptist, the first person to refer to Jesus in this manner. From John chapter 1, verses 29 and 36. When Jesus came to allow John to baptize him, John cried out, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Now, this is taken and put into Mass. There's a lot going on here. This is a reference to the great suffering servant from the prophet Isaiah, whom God, of course, would one day send to rescue Israel from sin. Isaiah put it, of course, in these very famous terms, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter. And of course, the mention of a lamb being slain reminds us of what? Passover, right? And Passover lambs. But what Isaiah, of course, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, introduced was the notion of an individual person being sacrificed for our sins. So when we hear those words of John the Baptist, we know that right there in front of us, under the appearances of bread and wine, it's not only the one who takes away the sin of the world, the long-awaited Messiah. The Messiah is also here. But of course, in our Mass, the priest connects all of this sacrifice back to the notion of a meal. Because after all, those of you about to receive Holy Communion, you're about to eat the bread of angels, right? You're about to consume God himself. So what do you hear? The most important words you'll hear all day. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. What are you supposed to be doing at that point? I told you twice. Behold. Take in. Acknowledge. Your spirit, your heart, your soul, everything about you is wide, wide open. Okay, behold him. You will never hear more important words in your life. Except for some of you, I absolve you from your sins. And then you can go hear those most important words, okay? But then you get to say in response the most important words you will ever say. And I'm not joking, guys. This is the most important words you'll say back to this. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof. But only say the word, and my soul shall be healed. The great question is, how can us mere humans, and sinful ones at that, 
dare to approach the Almighty God in this way. Because we have to be honest. We have to be, have to be very, very humble. We're not worthy. We know that. Who, who's kidding who? We're not worthy. But let me give you a bit of hope here. A big, big chunk of hope here, okay? You think that's going to stop God? You think a little bit of unworthiness on your part is going to stop Him? Are you kidding me? He died for you. So you can, you can be then become worthy. That's not going to stop Him at all. So yes, it is true we're not worthy. He should enter under our roof, which has a double meaning. Roof means not only that particular church you happen to be in. So we all say it together. Lord, I'm not worthy, but we're all saying I. So we're all tied in together. You enter under this, this roof. Okay. But thank you for coming here to this church here, Lord. It also is a reference to the roof of your soul. The roof of your soul. Your soul is not just something kind of floating around. It contains, and your soul contains Jesus Christ. Okay? So the roof of your soul is the meaning, particularly there at that point of the Mass. And so we have faith. We have hope. And so what do you all say with the utmost of sincerity? But only say the word, and my soul shall be healed. Those words, of course, reflect the great humility of the Roman centurion. From the Gospels, of course, who asked Jesus to heal his servant. He knew he wasn't worthy to have Jesus come over to his house, but he believed that Jesus could heal, even from a distance. We have to have that same belief. Only say the word. That, of course, is a powerful reference, of course, to Jesus Christ himself. He, of course, is the word. In the beginning was the word. But it's also our way of giving him permission to enter into our souls, then into our bodies, then into our hearts, then into our minds. Only say the word is our way of acknowledging that all healing, all grace, ultimately comes from God. But now, why do we go back to the old translation? Because the new one that we had for, you know, for those couple of decades there, said, and only say the word and I shall be healed. We went back to saying, only say the word in my soul shall be healed. Why is that? Simple. If you're doing well, even great, mentally, emotionally, physically, but your soul is a mess, well guess what? You are a mess. Just that simple. Oh, I got all this money, man. I don't have a care in the world, man. I'm fit as an ox here, baby. My heart, it's all good, man. Yeah, I've been to Mass in 35 years, man. The list of sins you've committed, man, shh, man. We're running out of charm in here to keep track of this stuff here, right? Your soul is a mess, you're a mess. Okay? Flip that around. If you're struggling mentally, emotionally, physically, man, you've got trials and problems and headaches, and man, it's, it's rough. But your soul is filled with Christ. You have his peace, his comfort, his joy, his strength. Well, then guess what? You're alive, man. You're blessed. Because your soul is full. Because it all starts with healing your soul. The soul is the deepest part of who you are. That's the part that you want to be healed, and to be healed first. That's what drives every other aspect of your life. So that's why we say that. We now, of course, get ready for Holy Communion. Now the priest, or if there's a deacon or deacons with them, then consume both the body and the blood of Christ. Now, here's a note. We are the only ones who have to consume both. Okay? You all don't. You can have just the host or just the precious blood. Now the thing is, is this. Both the host and the chalice are the fullness of the communion rite. Okay, that's what most places tend to offer both on Sundays, at least on Sundays, okay? Because it's the fullness of the sacrament. This is because, but for us priests, we have to do both. We have to, because we have to complete the sacrifice. Because we're in the person of Jesus, and Jesus, of course, gave both his body and his blood to his apostles, so we have to consume both. But, even if you only receive one, just the host, or let's say, maybe some of you here tonight might have some allergies to wheat. 
So you only go on and just have a sip of the precious blood? No matter. Because Jesus is no longer dead, he's glorified, he's risen, his body and blood are back together again and can never be separated again. So because of that, you receive one species, you receive both. You receive one, you receive the other. So you're not missing out on anything. Or even if you sit way, way in the back, because you, you were late for Mass, okay? I saw you sneak in, Mass, okay? Cool. I'd say no, all right? So you're way in the back with all the rest of the crazies there, okay? You come up for communion, and since it was a big crowd that day, you had to break the host, you only got like a little, little piece of the host instead of, instead of the full one. You didn't get gypped. So you got the fullness of Jesus Christ, body, blood, soul, and divinity. You still got the fullness of our Lord, okay? But now, how should we come forward to receive our Lord in Holy Communion? And then what should we do once we receive? All right? You better grab your cheeks and shake them up. You better wake up for this one now. Here we go. All right? That's what it's all about here, okay? First of all, you're not coming up in fear like Dorothy and the rest of the Wizard of Oz, okay? Oh, holy hand, oh, 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 okay, right? <laughs> Don't do that, okay? But there still has to be holy fear. In other words, awe. The proper word, the gift of awe, the gift of holy reverence. But we should realize, and we do forget this, don't we? Sometimes us priests forget this. You're coming forward to receive God. Okay, let me say that again. You're coming forward to receive the one who made you, the one who's trying to save you, the one who's for eternity. God is who you're coming up to receive. But our journey from the pews to the steps of the altar is also a journey of joy and great anticipation. Great anticipation. Because remember all those things we talked about earlier you put up on the altar? Remember that? I keep going back to that. It's so important. All those things you put up there for the offertory, all those intentions, all taken up to heaven by God's holy angel. Well, now our Lord Jesus himself is coming to personally be in communion with you and give you exactly what you need to carry on. That's why so much faith is needed. But you have it. You have it. When the priest or the minister says, the body of Christ, the blood of Christ, and you say with full conviction, amen, amen. Because as many, many of you know, amen means I believe. I believe. Or, there's a double meaning with the word amen, which is a beautiful thing, because some people struggle with issues of faith. Some people are very struggling that that really is Jesus and not a symbol. So amen also means, may it be so. Lord, I want to believe. I want to receive. I really do. Help my faith. May it be so. That being the case, you don't walk up to receive communion, blowing kisses at everybody, shaking hands, patting people on the back, as if you're running for mayor, man. What are you doing? Okay? <laughs> You're completely focused on who you're about to receive. And I don't see that very often, man. That's why we have these classes here, okay? All right? And people come up, and it's, it's amazing what they're doing, all right? But once Jesus is on your tongue, and you turn and head back to your pew, avoid two definite things, okay? Number one, don't just get back to your place there in the pew and kneel down and say some quick little whatever prayer. Uh, thanks for the grub, Lord. Whatever, okay? It's amazing when people do what goes through their minds, okay? And then just kick back and watch everybody else if you're watching some kind of parade, man. Okay? You're not even kneeling. How come you're not kneeling anymore? You're sitting back watching everybody. Oh, wow, I didn't know those two were going out together. Look at that. Oh, she's pregnant. Check it out, man. Okay? That dude, the Bronco fan, check that guy out, man, okay? What are you doing? What are you doing? Okay? You have the Lord of Lords within you. His blood is now part of your blood. Don't be distracted or you'll miss out on so much grace. But second, even though it is a nice thing for those of you who want to, just sing along with the communion songs, okay? Still, you better be prepared for some silence, for some one-on-one -on -one with our Lord Jesus. You have to have that when you go to Mass. Because the second mistake that people will start doing, once they receive Jesus, they go back to the pew, offer some quick little thanksgiving, 
and start thinking about everything else they have to do that day instead of making the most out of that communion experience. So thinking about what? Okay, let's see. Lasagna? Enchiladas? What should it be here, man? Oh, oh man, that project is due on Tuesday. Okay, I just got to take care of that. Right. Once again, what are you doing? Why are you daydreaming? Your focus has to be on who is within you, okay? So, here are a couple of pieces of advice to help you out with just that. The first one is what our Lord Jesus wants to do with us all the time. Pretty much every single time you come to Mass. Now, true. Sometimes when you come to Mass, you're praying big time for a particular situation, a particular person, and so you're going to spend your entire time after receiving Jesus in communion, talking with Him about those things or that, that person, okay? That's fine, but that's the exception. That's the exception. When you come back to kneel in your pew, you spent the entire Mass in adoration. Meaning, of course, what? Looking for the face of God. Focusing on the face of God. Now, with Jesus within you, back at your pew, Jesus wants to look at your face. It's his turn to look at you. Let him see your face. In other words, don't hide a thing from him. You now have to be totally transparent before him. Absolutely nothing to hide. So the great question that you ask Jesus, and this takes courage, but guess what? You have the Holy Spirit with you. You have courage. Lord, what do you see when you see me? Lord, I'm tired of looking at myself in the mirror and seeing what I think I see. Or what my spouse tells me, or my girlfriend, or what the boss says. No, I want to know, what do you see when you see me? You know what Jesus will do? He'll take that beautiful face of yours, or handsome for you guys, okay? He'll take that face of yours and to his hands and take a good, long look at you. Listen. For some of you, he will say straight up to you, let me see you here. You look pretty scared. You're worried about a lot of things, aren't you? Let me be your strength and your peace. For others, he'll take your face into his hands and look at you and say, Man, you look defeated. You look terribly discouraged. Let me be your victory. Let me be the one to lift up your head. For others of you, he'll take your face into his hands, his powerful hands of his, but they're gentle. He'll say to you straight up, You're still fighting me, aren't you? You're still struggling with me. Let me help you to let go, to forgive, so I can totally give you your life back. And for those of you who are actually doing great, well, Jesus will still look at you, take that face, maybe give him a couple of pinch of your cheeks there, man, man, life is going good, isn't it? Well, let's rejoice together. But I cannot emphasize enough how important it is to have that conversation with Jesus, especially when you have him right there in communion with you. Don't fail to, to do that, okay? The other piece of advice is to make sure that you receive from our Lord Jesus what you need when it comes to the offering you place upon the altar. So once again, during the offertory, during the prayers of the faithful, what you put up there? In the chalice, on the paten, you put your hopes, your dreams, your struggles, your fears, the people in your life, and you put yourself up there too, right? Well, Jesus will, in many instances, bring you the exact answer you were looking for. At that Mass, you got it. Or, he may give you an insight you never even thought about before. Or, he may give you an additional boost of patience and perseverance to wait a bit longer because it's not quite the right time. Because God's timing is perfect, but the beautiful thing about that is God will wait with you wait by yourself, okay? Maybe Jesus just wants to see if you have more faith. He's going to test you a little bit. Okay, here's some more patience. Not quite there yet. Let's see how strong your faith is. He does all these things because he loves you, okay? But so very, very often, you will receive an enormous amount exactly what you need during Holy Communion. So 
take advantage of that aspect as well every time you come to mass. Okay. When it's all said and done, we now move to the concluding rites. So after giving communion to everyone, the priest goes back, or sometimes it's the deacon, to clear the altar with the servers, and we pay particular attention and reverence to the purifying of the vessels, the paten, the saboria, the chalice, because Jesus was just in those vessels just a moment ago. In fact, it's a beautiful reminder of the Mel Gibson movie, The Passion of Christ. Remember during the scourging at the pillar, all that blood of our Lord, that incredibly moving, powerful scene of his mother Mary getting that cloth and mopping up the blood. Okay? An incredible act of honor and reverence. It's exactly what we're doing. It's exactly what his priests are doing at that point of the Mass. And then when that's done, I go and I take a seat before the final prayer. But here the priest is not taking a break. I'm not, I'm not catching my breath, getting a little, little, little you know, chill time. That's not what I'm doing. I'm still working. When I go back to the chair, I have to say one final prayer on to God on behalf of all of you. I'm still praying for you guys. What am I praying for? Sometimes it's a little bit longer, sometimes a little bit shorter, but it all comes to the same thing. I first of all give thanks to God for those who got it. For those who came to Mass and truly received. That's one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. Sometimes I'll sneak a little peek and take a look at you guys, man. You all are praying away. You're just glowing, man. You got the Holy Spirit all over you, man. Some of you stood up your face in Jesus' hands. That's a beautiful thing to say, man. I can see that. Okay? That's awesome. All right? I thank God for that. But I also ask God to continue His work through the Holy Spirit on those who still don't believe. Because not everybody who goes to communion believes that that's Jesus up there. Not everybody, not, everybody, not everybody believes what they're receiving. But the bottom line, of course, is what, that everyone will receive something if they're paying attention every time they come to Mass. Some receive great joy, great peace. They got that mercy. They got their conviction back. Others receive the truth. But still others, the stubborn ones, they receive a strong sense of what? Conviction. Is God is still trying to work with them to get them to where they need to be. If you're honest with yourself, everybody receives something there at Mass. And so after the final prayer of the Mass, which is almost always a prayer of deep, deep gratitude, the priest will give you all a final blessing. So I say, the Lord be with you and with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go forth, the Mass is ended. You all say, well, thank God, man. Six, 62 minutes today, Father. <laughs> you used like 56, man. What's going on? A little longer. Is that what you said? <laughs> Thanks be to God. Well, maybe a part of that's in there. Okay, I'll give it up to you, all right? You say, thanks be to God. See, in the ancient world, it was customary to end <coughs> an assembly with a formal dismissal. So from at least the 4th century onward, the Latin words, ita misa est, were used for this dismissal. Even though those words literally mean, go, you are dismissed. What we hear at the end of Mass is, go forth, the Mass is ended. What's most significant about that, the whole liturgy receives its name, the Mass, from that word, Misa, in the closing line. This points to what? How the Mass ultimately should be ascending forth. You guys are blasting out of there. Okay, because you're equipped with the Holy Spirit. The Lord Jesus is within you. You're ready to go and conquer the world. It's, that's how it's supposed to be, okay? In fact, the Catechism tells us in number 91, the Eucharist is called Holy Mass because the liturgy in which the mystery of salvation is accomplished concludes with the sending forth of the faithful so that they may fulfill God's will in their daily lives. But keep in mind, Jesus told his apostles in John 20, 21, As the Father has sent me, so now I send you. Now, are you being sent by yourself? Be all by yourself in this crazy world? No, I think he's going with you. Isn't that what communion's all about? Yeah, communion, okay? He's with you. So together, you and the Lord and the body of Christ, we go out there and change lives. That's what we're supposed to do, okay? You're being dismissed, but with a mission. 
You're being sent forth, but filled with the presence of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You're more deeply connected to the entire body of Christ, those in heaven, those in purgatory, those here on earth. And you're now ready to be a living, breathing temple of the Holy Spirit, literally able to bring Jesus Christ to all that you need, bring the light of Christ into this world. Well, thank you, and may God bless.